All right, welcome back. Uh, up next, we have the orbital spaceflight panel. And uh, orbital spaceflight has been restricted pretty much to only the wealthiest government programs since it's, since it's been a concept, basically. Um, and the panel will now be discussing uh, more commercial companies and what these companies are doing to like open up Earth orbit to the general public. Um, the moderator for this panel will be Dennis Stone, who is an assistant manager for commercial space development um, in NASA's commercial crew and cargo program, which manages the COTS initiative. Um, Dennis Stone. Thank you very much. Well, this builds very well on the last panel, which dealt with opening the suborbital uh, to a wide variety of markets. And so now we're going to take it to the next level, literally, to LEO and talk about um, not only the, uh, the new services that are going to become available uh, to, to uh, open LEO, but also hopefully the, uh, the markets and the, and the demands for those services. And so we have a very, very distinguished panel. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to follow Alan Stern's uh, uh, paradigm and let, let each one introduce themselves, starting with, uh, with Phil. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Uh, my name is Phil McAllister, and uh, since February, I have been leading the planning at NASA headquarters for the Commercial Crew Initiative. Um, so we've been busy trying to flesh that out and to put uh, sort of meat on the bones as to what that program is, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my prepared remarks. Um, in terms of my background, uh, I have always been affiliated with the commercial space industry, even though this is my first time at this conference. Um, but the two notable things uh, with respect to um, sort of commercial crew that I was involved in historically was uh, I was at uh, Futron actually when we did the Futron Zogby uh, survey. So I oversaw that and was manager of that development effort and that survey and the forecast that we did. Um, so that gave me a lot of insight into the demand for human space transportation. And then last year I was the NASA liaison to the Augustine Committee. Um, so I was uh, able to um, hear all the deliberations, uh, participate in all the fact-finding associated with the Augustine Committee, which really set, in my opinion, uh, set the stage for change uh, that we needed uh, in our human spaceflight program. So. Very good. Hi, good morning. I'm Mark good morning. I am the, I run Sierra Nevada Space Systems, and I'm also the chairman of the Commercial Spaceflight Federation. And primarily today, I'm going to be speaking to those two topics, where we are in our program. We were one of the award winners under the Commercial Crew Development Program, and we've been working that for, uh, for a number of months now and been working our orbital space vehicle uh, program for about five years. I'll bring you up to date as to what that's where that is and what it's going to be looking like and what the prospects are, and also speak a little bit to the commercial space flight industry and where that is as a, as a status. So I'm Jim Muncy. I'm a space policy consultant in Washington. I'm one of the three co-founders of the Space Frontier Foundation. Um, I'm not going to be speaking on behalf of any clients, uh, although I do have clients that are working in the uh, orbital human spaceflight uh, arena. Uh, I'm going to try to take, uh, I'm supposed to talk a little bit more about the political environment and policy environment and what's been going on the last six to seven months since the President's budget came out. and. Uh, hopefully point some directions towards where we might go uh, going forward so that commercial crew can move forward. Well, very good. And so we'll follow a similar model as the, the last panel. We'll give a few remarks, uh, have some <clears throat> discussion among ourselves, and then open the floor to questions. And perhaps maybe a, a final minute of, of wrap-up comments uh, each. So um, I don't think I need to say anything in the way of context about the importance of, of getting to orbit uh, and reducing the cost, increasing the reliability. I mean, that's certainly the, one of the great mantras of this organization, and so that would be preaching to the choir if I did that. But I think that's really our mindset. Um, you know, I work in the uh, commercial uh, crew and cargo program, or C-3PO, as we affectionately call it. Um, actually, when I, we started, it was being called the uh, commercial crew and cargo program, CCCP. And, okay, so some of you are old enough to understand the negative connotations of that brand. So I, I asked Alan Lindemoyer, I said, are we in office? He said, yeah. And I said, oh, well, then 
let's call ourselves C3PO. So anyway, that's stuck. Anyway, um, and so we do several things, just kind of an introduction. Uh, we run the COTS program, uh, Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, and I think most of you know what that is, so I won't belabor you with the details, but we have two funded partners, SpaceX and Orbital Sciences Corporation. Um, we have a $500 million fund, and we treat that as an investment uh, in the capabilities of the private sector. And then uh, this International Space Station program then has purchased services from them. So we're an investor and we're uh, a customer. Now, Alan mentioned that Sir Richard, uh, when he heard that he was going to buy tickets, you know, was shining his shoes. And I don't think, I don't think uh, Elon Musk or, or David Thompson have, have, have shined any shoes. Uh, but anyway, that, be that as it may, I, that's certainly not one of the requirements of the program. But, uh, <laughs> you know, if they want to shine our shoes, I mean, certainly welcome to. But, um, no, but they both are performing really well. Um, as you know, the Falcon 9 had a, a very, very successful maiden launch uh, recently. Um, the first COTS demo flight is coming up here. Uh, I think it's scheduled for, for September. Um, and so they have three demos leading up to uh, a test to the space station. Orbital Sciences uh, doing a, a similar program, one test flight. They started later. Um, we funded them later, but they're doing really, really well. They're building a, a launch site and, uh, at Wallops, and they're making excellent progress. So. COTS cargo is, is going well, and as I say, Station has given them both uh, very large contracts to deliver lots of cargo that we need on the space station uh, for a several year period. So this is a, it's an interesting model. It's a new model for NASA. Again, we, uh, you know, uh, when Mike Griffin set up, we have 500 million, and he fenced that very well for commercial cargo. Uh, we treated it as an investment. We hired a venture capitalist to help, to help us think, uh, think like an investor. We built uh, agreements based on space, the Space Act and special authority that NASA has with milestones. And you know, you, they, they build and test and fly, we pay incrementally, even financial milestones. If they're going to go raise money and, and have skin in the game, great. Well, show us the deposit in the bank, and we'll, we'll pay you as well. So all of that's negotiated in advance. Um, and so it's been, it's been working, working quite well. So that's a $500 million program we manage. And then we also got $50 million of stimulus money. And as, as, as Mark mentioned, uh, there's a commercial crew uh, development program, which is basically beginning to work with the industry to mature their concepts uh, and technologies. And so we have five, five partners in addition to you know, the, the, the fine work that the Sierra Nevada is doing, and actually you're the largest recipient of, of funding under that program, I might know. Uh, we also have uh, the United Launch Alliance working on uh, emergency detection system for the Atlas V and Delta IV, uh, one of the steps that might be necessary to human rate those vehicles. Boeing is developing, um, I think Jim mentioned this in his opening remarks, a, uh, a capsule that could be launched on any of those vehicles, and, and Bob Bigelow is one of their, their partners. Um, Blue Origin, a company uh, you may know of, founded by uh, Amazon's Jeff Bezos. They're also a partner. They're working on some technologies of mutual interest. And of course, they've got their eye on suborbital and then orbital. And uh, so they're, they're definitely an interesting, interesting player. And also Paragon, more at a, a subsystem level. They're working on some innovative uh, life support technologies. And all this under st uh, stimulus money that uh, we have for this year. So, and also using these Space Act agreements with the same paradigm of uh, pay-as-you-go milestones. So this kind of sets a, a stage as we, you know, we can talk about cargo, we can talk about crew, and we can talk about really any orbital space transportation issues that uh, we want to we we get to today. So let, let's let our panelists have a few moments to, to give some remarks. Phil, I will start with you. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, amazingly, I only have one slide, and it's just a graphic, so hopefully we can get that up uh, soon. And we're still tweaking it. There it is. Can't quite get all of it. When we started the planning for this commercial crew program, we felt like we wanted to have a vision of where we were trying to get to eventually in the future, and that's why we developed this graphic. You can see where we're trying to inter integrate 
space flight operations. You can see the two different launch pads in the back with sort of uh, ongoing routine uh, aircraft aviation flights and the space station up in the upper right hand corner because that is for NASA the near term milestone. So um, the commercial crew program, if it gets approved by Congress, uh, is designed to invest in the capability to transport humans to and from low Earth orbit. And once that capability is matured and shown to be safe, reliable, and cost effective, NASA hopes to be a partner, a customer in the near term uh, to purchase those services to transport our crew up and down from the um, International Space Station. So those are the three uh, cost, I'm sorry, safe, reliable, and cost effective. Those are the three sort of legs of the stool that we feel are very important for this program that need to be accomplished. So. Um, again, the vision is routine access to space for humans. We've been talking about that for decades, and I truly believe that the commercial crew program is the next step in that direction. If we're successful, uh, and there are a lot of challenges associated with this, both internal to NASA, external to our stakeholders, the technology, the business case, there's lots of challenges associated with this, but if we are successful, a um, lot of benefits are going to flow. We believe this will strengthen the International Space Station program because it gives us another way to transport crew to and from space station to dovetail on some of the remarks that, um, that we heard earlier today. We have this great space station. We need to be able to use it, and the way to use it is to have transportation uh, for humans up and down. So we think it will um, strengthen the International Space Station. It will allow NASA to focus on beyond LEO. Uh, it will enhance our industrial base, um, contribute to the national economy, world peace. Okay, world peace may be going a little bit too far. But other than world peace, all those other things I do think are appropriate and will, would uh, come to bear if we are successful. I'm going to really uh, restrict my comments today to two areas, but I'm really looking forward to hearing what your questions are um, and happy to address those. The two issues that I get uh, hit with most often are the business case for commercial crew and safety. So I'm just going to spend a couple minutes on that. In terms of the business case, I cannot uh, with a high confidence say that we've got an analysis, a study that closes the business case for commercial crew. In any business case, you need the supply and you need the demand. These systems do not exist yet, so we don't know how much they're going to cost right now. We've got estimates. We're looking for our commercial providers to put forward um, some good, high-quality proposals in the future if the program gets approved. But today, not really sure on the supply side how much these systems are going to cost, so it's very difficult to um, uh, definitively say for NASA that the business case can close. But what we can say is that there is demand for human space transportation to and from low Earth orbit. That is a historical fact. So when I hear uh, comments um, in the media of this you know, future predicted market, uh, I have to say I don't agree with that because historically NASA and Russia have flown astronauts from other countries um, since 1978. And since that time, over that 30-year period, we have launched both between NASA and uh, Russia almost 100 astronauts from other countries. That averages about three a year. In addition, we've seen the space flight participant market, otherwise known as space tourism, since 2001. Eight people have flown to space, including one reflight. So it was nine person flights, so that equates to about one person per year. And if you look at it, NASA's demand right now, and we're still tweaking this, we look like we are going to need about eight uh, flights, eight person flights a year with another four from other markets. That's a 50% increase. That's a pretty good demand. Those aren't huge numbers, uh, but the, the demand is real, um, and you can point to it. In addition, you've got Bigelow Aerospace that has spent uh, reported $180 million on their inflatable modules. Um, that would be another destination for these crew transportation services. Um, Bigelow has estimated uh, six flights per year initially, ramping up to 100 by the end of the decade. So that's obviously a very robust uh, indicator of demand for human spaceflight services. Uh, in addition, with our CCDEV um, procurements or Space Act agreements that you heard earlier, uh, NASA received over 30 proposals for, uh, from US aerospace industry for those, uh, for those Space Act agreements. So that shows, again, a very robust interest level on the part of U.S. aerospace to supply systems for commercial crew. 
But the biggest and, uh, in my opinion, strongest indicator, I, I characterize all these as positive indicators, uh, was the decision on the part of the administration to extend the life of the International Space Station likely to 2020 and beyond. So for the first time in history, we have a real, reliable, sustainable market for human space transportation services. Um, and I think that was the key to enable this program to go forward and one of the factors that uh, played into the administration's decision to go forward with the commercial crew program. Uh, so that is sort of the demand side of the equation. In terms of safety, uh, that is another area that uh, a lot of people have talked about. And there's several factors why we believe that this, uh, that we can accomplish this safely. First off, the mission is much simpler than what NASA was in, embarking on previously with the Constellation program. Um, this is really just geared for up and down space transportation, possibly crew risk rescue services as well. This is something that we did in the United States 30 years ago with Gemini. That was the closest analog to this. So it's, uh, you know, human spaceflight, I don't know if it'll ever be truly, truly routine, but this in, is, is a relatively well understood mission and relatively simple compared to the program of record that we were um, working on before, which really was focusing on beyond LEO and a lunar, and a lunar mission as well. So it's a fairly simple mission, again, one that we demonstrated in the U.S. over 30 years ago. So we feel like that is, uh, that is a key factor. Also, whatever rockets that are, whatever launch vehicles that are ultimately chosen are going to have a demonstrated history, flight history, um, of reliability. So we're not going to be launching any crews on an unproven rocket that just has maybe a, a probabilistic risk assessment that says it's this safe. There's going to have to be demonstrated reliability through the test program that we're going to have to have as part of the commercial crew program to give NASA and the crew and the provider the confidence that these systems are safe. In addition, NASA will be intimately involved in the development of these systems. Uh, a lot of people have characterized this as hands-off. Uh, it is not going to be hands-off. NASA is going to be very, in, again, intimately involved in understanding the nature of the program, the nature of these systems. What we're not going to be intimately involved in is telling the provider how to do it. Uh, we're trying very hard to set up this program where we um, establish high-level goals for what we want and allowing the commercial providers the maximum flexibility to achieve those goals. So um, if you look at previous human spaceflight uh, programs on the part of NASA, we were, we owned the system, we, uh, ha we owned every major decision, and we were almost in this continuous oversight mode where we were continually telling the contractor how to do their job and what specific uh, um, technologies to use, subsystems to use, even component level to use. That is not going to be uh, the way we envision executing this program. We will be intimately involved in understanding the nature of the program, but allowing the providers, the commercial providers, and again, you can see I don't call them contractors. These are partners for us because we're investing in them. The commercial providers, the maximum flexibility to achieve those goals um, as we go forward. So we feel like that's a big key factor for the cost effectiveness of it, but will also enable us to understand the true nation almost uh, better than the way we did it before, which was relying on stacks and stacks of documentation at major design reviews where we would give, you know, NASA people would come in with hundreds of people, review those documents, and send, you know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of comments back to the contractor on how to change things. Uh, we do not envision doing that as part of the commercial crew program. We would be, uh, some of our civil servants will be embedded into the contractor's locations where they're doing this design and development work so that we can see the test results, we can witness the raw data and get a true understanding of that program, but we will have discrete oversight milestones. So we will not be in this continuous mode where we're continually telling them what to do. It will be uh, discrete points where we will evaluate them and see if they have met uh, the requirements of the milestones. Again, we are going to um, we're fashioning this program very similar to the Cots Carter program where we have pre-negotiated milestones. So when they meet a milestone and we all agree that they meet a milestone, they get paid. It's not on a cost plus basis. We feel like a cost plus uh, contracting environment is not consistent with a commercial crew program. And so uh, we envision, uh, we haven't actually laid our acquisition strategy uh, to bed yet, but we envision 
potentially using this other Transactional Authority Space Act agreements or fixed price uh, contracting mechanisms for this service. We, um, so those are the two things that I definitely wanted to hit today. And again, really looking forward to your questions. I hope they're hard because I like answering the hard questions. This is a fairly friendly audience for commercial crew. Uh, but if you guys have heard anything that um, you're curious about and how we're addressing it, be happy to uh, take those questions on. Thank you. Good morning. Well, that's going up. I'd like to uh, start my talk just by providing a little bit of definition. I, uh, as I mentioned, I run Sierra Nevada Space Systems, but I'm also the, currently the chairman of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. And one of the things that we've been doing this past year is spending an awful lot of time trying to define and explain what that means. And uh, there's so many different views and, and so many different points of uh, reference to it. It's, it's really a very simple thing. Uh, what, we, what we believe that we're doing differently is not in the companies. We hear all the time that, well, these are startup companies working out of a garage. They, they've never done anything in space before. They're not safe. They, all these long list of things. And uh, what I'm going to try to do today in the next few minutes is really address that by virtue of two, two things. One, by explaining what we're doing as commercial space, and then secondly, using my own company as an example of, of how we're going about doing this particular program. Uh, really, on the commercial space side, Every company that's worked with NASA is a commercial company. Uh, the only difference really is in the contracting method. Uh, you go back to the 50s and when NASA first started, NASA itself has never really built a vehicle all on its own. It's always used contractors in some form or fashion. So really the difference here is, is quite simple. The difference is instead of being a cost plus contractor, as Phil mentioned, we're willing to do things in a different way. Under a contract that's a milestone-based contract, that means we get paid as we go along. The second thing that's different is that we're willing to co-invest. We're putting up our own money alongside the government. So instead of the government spending all of its own money, we're spending a good part of our money. In my company's case, we're, we're more than exceeding NASA's investment. So for every dollar NASA is giving us, we're putting in more than NASA is putting in, which means we're pretty well motivated to make this work. The third thing is that as, instead of being uh, as cost plus contracts often are, there's little motivation to bring things in on schedule or on budget. And when you're dealing with a scenario where you're doing a fixed price contract, which at the end of the day means that we're providing a service at a price, we're interested to get to that service as soon as possible in as safe as possible manner. And you know what? F right now, NASA is doing that currently. Uh, our contract with the Russians is a commercial contract on a fixed price basis to provide a service. What we're simply saying is cannot U.S. industry, cannot the people in this industry do the same thing that we're contracting out to Russia? bring those jobs home to, to this country, be able to reinvest in America. We have a long-standing industry with a lot of abilities to do things, and we think and believe that that's the case, that we can accomplish that. As to safety, uh, we oftentimes um, smile about that, because at the end of the day, no one is going to fly on any vehicle of any type unless they pass the flight standards. It's no different than building an airplane, which is where I came from. You're building an airplane, it's going to require a certain amount of standards and, and requirements from the FAA and other agencies before that airplane can take off. The space industry, in my view, is going to be the same thing. And those standards are going to apply to anyone, whether or not they're done as a government contract or whether or not they're done as a commercial provider or whether or not they're done as an international provider. Strangely enough, if you go back right now, we, we do not subject the uh, Soyuz program to those, to those standards. So as we're going forward, the idea of safety is really a non-question. If we don't pass the st set standards that NASA and other agencies are going to put together, like the FAA, we're not going to fly. And at the end of the day, if we don't fly, we've lost an awful lot of our own investment and our money. So we're going to make sure we meet those standards. If I could turn to, uh, to give you a little bit of view of, of Sierra Nevada has been around since the uh, 1960s. It's been under current management since the 1990s. We're a little uh, over a billion dollar revenue. We're in 35 locations and over 2,200 people, uh, a company that has the resources to be able to do the job. Our space group is broken into four different parts. We are one of the leading providers of small satellites in the world right now. We're one of the top providers of components and subsystems to large uh, large programs, uh, large uh, satellite programs, as well as interplanetary programs. We are a rocket motor provider uh, in, uh, in a number of different ways and special, uh, specialized rocket motors. And we're developing a space vehicle that we call the Dream Chaser. 
we've uh, been doing this for quite a long time, 22, 22 years of work. We've uh, flown on 300, over 300 missions now to space, 313 missions. We're flying about once every six weeks now and have built something over in the order of uh, over 3,000 mechanisms, subsystems, and satellites, all of which, which have worked on, on orbit. Uh, we know on how to build things for space, as do other companies who are doing this kind of work. The programs vary. We've been to Mars a number of times on a number of different programs, and, and many of you probably have seen or worked on, on these programs. We are a leading provider of small satellites, and I put this slide up here for a reason. Um, we uh, currently have a backlog of many dozens of small satellites that we're building, and one of the things that Phil raised in his talk was the market. One of the, as we look to the market, it's not just a market, in our company's case, for bringing things back and forth to the space station. There are other things we can do in space, not the least of which is servicing in space. As the shuttle retires, there is really no way that we're going to be able to, at this current time, uh, do uh, significant servicing of LEO, servicing in terms of uh, deploying satellites, potentially bringing those satellites home. And as you'll see as I go into my talk, the vehicle that we have is, is quite well suited for that. So the, the commercial market is beyond we think just the, the markets that may bring people to space. There are other things that we can do with these vehicles. Uh, we are uh, the, the uh, prime motor contractor for the Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 program. The motor that we're building is the, the motor that will be taking the Spaceship 2 on its, on its journey and its flights. We're well into that development program. And as a result of that, uh, we have, uh, have accumulated quite a lot of experience, not only on this program, but other rocket motor programs, and understanding how to develop rocket motors that function and function well in this kind of environment and also are reusable, which is a big issue of our, our program. I'd like to spend uh, the next couple of minutes before I go off and give you a sense of where we are in our space vehicle program we call the Dream Chaser. This is what it looks like. It is a uh, seven passenger, or seven crew vehicle. It could be set up as all crew, it could be set up as all cargo, and it has multiple missions. The, the view of this vehicle is that it is a vertical takeoff, horizontal landing vehicle that uh, has the ability, as, as we take pages out of a lot of industry, we want to be able to have one vehicle that can provide multiple missions. Much like Boeing builds a 747 that can be a crew, all, all passenger vehicle, can be all cargo, can fight fires, can do all sorts of things. By having a vehicle that has multiple missions and multiple purposes, we expand our market, which is really important in this early days in the commercial world because we want to have as big a market as possible. Uh, the team we have is an extraordinary team. We, uh, uh, unlike what you might hear, th these are companies and the teams and the other teams that are involved in the, in the NASA programs are similarly situated. We've reached out to the, get the best of the industry, uh, and this is best of large aerospace companies as well as small aerospace companies, as well as reaching out to the universities and education because we feel that's a very important part of our future. On our team for this program is United Launch Alliance. We have um, Draper Labs, which has been on every manned space flight program since the early 60s. Uh, Boeing Phantom Works, who is a, a significant provider of, of uh, space and aerospace activities. McDonald Detweiler, which many of you have known from building the, uh, the arms that are on the space station and on the shuttle, a huge space flight experience. Uh, we also have Colorado University. Uh, we, uh, it's, it's really great for us uh, to see the, the excitement and the level of interest that the students have. We have uh, several dozen students from, from CU who are on our program. And I've got to tell you, they bring more energy to us than, than we ever thought we would ever get. And it's, it's really stimulating. And we have, in many of our programs, we have about 60 active programs in, in our group, uh, reached out and have a component where we have students, in, and even down to high school level, who are working with us with the idea that not only do they see the future in aerospace, but I have to tell you, they bring an energy to our team, which makes us more, more excited about what we're doing. Uh, the other interesting thing about our team is that we actually have two, uh, actually three NASA centers now, two are on the chart, but we've reached out and are paying NASA to help us provide, get information. And this is all part of the long-term plan, that these relationships are two-way streets, that not only are, are we as a company looking for help from the government, but we're also providing opportunities for government people to work on our programs, which we pay for. Um, our program actually is not a new program. It goes back well into the last century. Uh, originally started as a Russian space program. NASA picked up this design of doing this type of vehicle in the 70s and 80s and spent about 10 years working on it under a program called the HL-20. 
We picked it up in the 90s and have been working on it ever since, but the history of the program goes back many years and it's not a new program. One of the things we hear is that what you're doing has never been done before and, and really that's not the case. As you'll see, there's a lot of heritage already existing in these vehicles. Uh, we're flying on an Atlas V. Um, uh, instead of designing our own launch vehicle, we said, why not look out there and, and we have. And the vehicle itself is actually launch agnostic, meaning that it can be launched on multiple kinds of vehicles. We're starting with the Atlas V because we think it's the best choice. It's flown now over 20, I believe 22 times. Would have flown 30 or 40 times by the time we put people on it. In our view, that's a, a pretty safe history and a pretty good history of, of understanding it. The vehicle can be launched on top. Our vehicle can be launched on top of the Atlas V. We spent a couple of years uh, looking at that particular uh, issue and have no, have developed no concerns with being able to do that. It eliminates quite a lot of things that have plagued the shuttle program over the years. Uh, we are well into the program. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years. We're actually constructing a vehicle now. We're expecting to start doing tests uh, within the next year or so. And we have a, a orbital test program date of 2014. This is not a, a program that's going to take 10 years to get to. The, uh, the idea behind what we're doing is not only servicing the uh, ISS, but also doing things like being able to do satellite repair and deployment, uh, potentially bringing things home. Uh, there is certainly military variants of over, over a piloted spacecraft like this that could happen. It could be operate unmanned as well as piloted if it needed to. But interestingly enough, one of the things that have been coming up to me was one, when you're running a business, sometimes it's the things you don't anticipate. But what we really, part of what we have in the industry, we have a paradox that's been here uh, forever, and that is it's very difficult to get something to fly in space unless you have heritage, and it's very difficult to get heritage unless you can fly. And we, we run into that problem all the time. And what I've been getting is a lot more phone calls than I ever realized about saying, we can actually use this vehicle to be an orbital test bed, to be able to take things up, to do things, uh, to, to test people's products, to be able to bring them back home. And the interesting thing is because it lands, and it lands on a runway, and it lands on any runway, really, 10,000 foot runway, the, the experiment or the, the device to very little return pressure. And as a result of that, we think that there's a, a very big market for that. Concurrently, one of the big problems with the space station, we've heard it's going to hopefully be extended, is that it's, there is no real planned way to bring stuff home right now. The uh, cargo vehicles that go up there don't come home. Uh, the Soyuz, which does come home, if anyone's ever seen a Soyuz capsule, you have to be uh, relatively small to get into it, and there's no really room to bring home any of the major experiments. So if we're going to have a successful program on the space station, our view, and one of the reasons we got into this design as a vehicle, was that we wanted to be able to bring things home in a benign, as benign as possible environment. Uh, we fly home, we land on a runway, we come home at less than two Gs, we can take racks directly from the space station and bring them in. And if you're doing sensitive experiments in space and you're spending what has been $100 billion to build the space station and many more billions to keep it up there, you want to be able to use it as well as possible. So we were targeting a market that was not only just delivering crews back and forth, but also what can we do in LEO and how could we extend the environment of the space station as much as possible. Uh, we are uh, in construction of the vehicle right now. These are photos that were taken in the last few months where we're actually building the, the tooling to build it. It's a composite vehicle and uh, it's well under its way. Uh, you'll see that's the pressurized center tool. Uh, it's, it's exciting because after many years of development we can actually go out and touch something. And I have to tell any of you who have been in this industry long enough, the difference between paper and touching something is amazing. Uh, we, we do it all the time. We've built a lot of stuff in space, but when something is personal like this is, you're able to actually get to a point of seeing it being built. It, it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, we also are well in our, our uh, methods for uh, rocket motor production for this particular vehicle. It will carry rockets. It will carry the same hybrid rockets that we're using for the Spaceship 2 program. So we're having dual use for that. The uh, use of hybrid rockets, for those of you who don't know, it's a base of rubber uh, is, the, is the fuel, and nitrous oxide is the oxidizer. So uh, recycled tires and laughing gas, I used to say. But it's a very effective uh, motor for this kind of application because uh, we are able to restart it and do things in space. It is a reusable motor, restartable motor, and throttleable motor. So it has some very good benefits for this particular program. And this is what you see in the testing program. So I'm going to end up on that, and I'd like to uh, welcome any questions. But we're quite excited about what we're doing. And I also want to say as I'm closing that 
none of this could be ha possible without the support of NASA and, and the people on the stage here. It's, it's not easy to do something new. It takes a lot of courage to stand up and try to make change. And the change here is, is not as dramatic as people like to think. The U.S. industry has been doing things like this for many, many years. We believe we can do it. We believe we can do it at least as well as foreign competitors can do it and using U.S. resources in building an industry. So I'd like to thank you for the time today, and I appreciate your, your listening to us, and I'll be happy to take any questions I can later. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Jim? Do you have slides? Of course not. I'm going to try to be brief and, and, and give us more time for interaction and, and discussion. Um, let me briefly just try to sort of cover the state of play uh, regarding commercial crew uh, and uh, this federal effort to enable commercial orbital human spaceflight. Um, as everyone knows, the Augustine Committee in its all of its options that it put forth for the administration uh, going forward. Uh, all of the options except for the program of record options uh, indicated that the most cost effective and early schedule arrival way of meeting the requirement for US human access to low Earth orbit for ISS uh, was commercial. Um, uh, they didn't get into uh, whether Ares 1 was a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, they didn't really get into, you know, attacking or criticizing technical options uh, at all. Uh, uh, but they just said, schedule-wise, it doesn't work. Uh, uh, by the time that you get there, uh, to, in order to be able to afford doing it, you end up not having ISS for it to visit. Uh, uh, and, and so they laid it out. And from talking to multiple members of the com commission, uh, they really didn't think that coming to that conclusion was going to be that controversial. Um, unfortunately, they were wrong uh, about that. Uh, the president's budget uh, took uh, actually paid attention to the commission. You know, we always talk about commissions and, you know, they gather dust and they don't get paid attention to. Not this time. Uh, the White House clearly paid attention, not just to the uh, key, you know, the, the high-level arguments that Augustine uh, made, but to a lot of the detailed ideas they presented. Um, uh, and they very clearly chose one of the options uh, as, as going forward. Uh, specifically, they thought that it was important enough to change the dynamic of how we get to low Earth orbit in this country to not just invest the minimum amount that Augustine uh, laid out, uh, roughly $2.5 billion with some, some cost growth uh, risk, uh, you know, a margin on that, but instead said, said we should spend, a, invest essentially $6 billion over five years in commercial crew. Um, um, given the juxtaposition of that against the cancellation of Constellation, and not actually initiating any government-owned and operated human spaceflight system for beyond Earth orbit um, really ended up causing a lot of heartache, uh, I think, for the people on the inside at NASA and in industry who were trying to make this work and make this happen as the best way to solve the, the need for low Earth orbit um, separate and apart from whatever you do beyond Earth orbit. Um, so we've had six months of yelling and screaming, uh, at least. Um, and depending on which committee of Congress you talk to, uh, different levels and different levels of hysteria, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, ranging, I'll, I'll start with the worst. The House Science Committee, the committee I used to work for, um, really, really, really wants Constellation back. Um, and the bill they produced this week, uh, marked up yesterday, basically restores, tries to restore Constellation. Now, they don't provide Constellation the funding that Constellation had previously budgeted 
or the funding that Augustine said it was necessary to actually carry it out and make it ex executable. Um, they limit uh, commercial orbital human spaceflight investments to 50 million per year over five years, plus what they thought was an ingenious idea of using loan guarantees to subsidize the development of commercial um, capabilities. Um, that's just a really bad idea. Um, loan guarantees work where you have uh, a marketable, uh, fungible commodity like a boat or a house, uh, and you are guaranteeing uh, um, basically the, the financing on that. And if the loan falls through, there's something to sell. Um, funding using using that to fund development is problematic in lots of lots of different ways. Um, so they really don't think that it's important. Now, two years ago, that was the House Science Committee along with the Senate Commerce Committee that enacted into law NASA authorization that mandated that NASA go forth and issue a notice of intent to award two or more commercial crew development contracts. So it was not a little more than 18 months ago that they had a different position. But in the, when given a choice between commercial and a government system as opposed to both, they decided they wanted the government system and not a commercial system. Uh, the House appropriators have been silent. They basically said they were going to listen to the authorizers and let everyone else go fight amongst themselves before they would take a position. Um, the Senate Commerce Committee last week marked up uh, uh, a legislation that tried to set a balance between government systems and commercial systems. Uh, they provided after an amendment was uh, offered uh, by uh, Senator Warner from Virginia, um, ended up providing $300 million uh, the first year and $500 million each of the second years. That's approximately half of what was budgeted by the President uh, over those three years. Um, and um, they also provided some restriction, restrictive language as to when NASA could enter into contracts to actually start developing. Uh, they said that the first year's funding basically has to be for extensions of the current CC dev activity. Uh, and they really aren't supposed to start a contract until you've done all these safety reviews and other things. Um, there's just no way to say this. I don't understand why, if you are worried about the gap in U.S. human spaceflight and, and having to pay Russia for uh, space goods and services and uh, effectively exporting our jobs to Russia, why you would say you can't even start for a year. Um, there's, there's just, I, I, I don't know how to nicely say, say that that's not stupid because it is stupid. Uh, um, the Senate appropriators largely uh, took the, ha the uh, Senate authorizers' uh, guidance. They ended up only providing $250 million in the first year and they only appropriate year by year. Well, what all this means, um, we're not going to have an actual appropriation bill for NASA until probably after the election. So there will be a continuing resolution that is in place for some number of months. Uh, hopefully the White House will engage in a more forceful manner in negotiations uh, down the road once we're past the election. Um, and we will get some level of funding with some restrictions. We'll, it will be what comes out of the process. Um, it is, it is mind-boggling to me that, um, I mean, even, even though we've gotten ourselves into this terrible situation where it's commercial LEO versus government beyond LEO as if the first doesn't enable, in fact, enable the latter, because that's exactly what, what is true. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be possible to reframe the debate between now and then to clarify this. Next year, we're going to have to have a different debate than the one we had this year. Um, some of the things that have been said are downright um, just idiotic. Um, uh, let, me, let me deal with the less idiotic arguments first. Um, staying, well, there's no, the only way commercial will work is if there's a huge private market. 
That's actually not true. Commercial is cheaper than a government system, not because there's a leveraging, not just because there's a leveraging of, of public resources with private resources in order to pursue private revenue. That's one of the reasons commercial is cheaper than an all government approach. But the other reasons it's cheaper is that we're setting, as uh, uh, Phil said, we're setting a Gemini standard, not an Apollo standard, okay? Uh, it's a simpler, easier challenge than what Orion is supposed to be able to do. We're operating under fixed price, which means that the company is motivated to find economies and ways of saving money uh, as opposed to motivated to spend as much money as possible to earn the maximum possible fee, um, which is just the reality of how cost plus contracting works. Um, and finally, commercial companies are always motivated to find private customers. They're always motivated to find new markets and new opportunities, uh, but you don't have to prove that those exist. I mean, commercial enti en entities, commercial entrepreneurs will actually take risks. Um, the argument's been made that, well, there's only been eight um, uh, uh, commercial uh, human space flights uh, or cu customers uh, in the last decade, and the Futron study there said there were supposed to be a lot more than that, so clearly there really isn't a market, so clearly commercial can't possibly work. Sort of a, 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 a illogical extension of the previous argument. Uh, the fact is, is that every single seat that has been made available on the Soyuz has been sold. Okay? The problem has not been a lack of demand, the problem has been a lack of supply. Uh, and therefore, investing in commercial crew will in fact create a new private, uh, dynamic private commercial industry. And we don't know how big it's going to be, but until we have more supply and until we have domestic supply and affordable supply, we aren't going to know how big it's going to be. Um, the last argument I will bring up is just this wacky argument that this is privatizing the army. Um, I don't know how to say it any differently. Um, we take army officers and we fly them on Southwest to Fort Bragg or some other location from which they embark to the war. And they catch a commercial flight, a regular commercial flight that has regular civilians on it. They then get on a Delta plane or an American plane that's hired under the Civil Reserve Air Fleet contracts that the Air Force has to purchase flights by commercial aircraft to fly military passengers. So it's still a commercial aircraft flying all the way into theater. Maybe not the right into the forward, not to the forward locations, but into the Gulf. And only then, they get on board the Air Force owned or Army owned operated say what I'm saying. That's why I'm saying it. So they don't have to. Okay? But it's just amazing. And when you hear it in the press, you all have an existential responsibility to go challenge it wherever you hear it. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Well, we've had some, a very good overview so far of NASA's plans for commercial crew, the industry perspective, uh, 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 uh,
Mark's company is really out there in front doing exactly what we had in mind uh, in, in the COTS arena and Jim's on the political perspective. And we're certainly not limited to talk about commercial crew here, but that does seem to be the topic. <laughs> ask the panelists to give me a, a, maybe a quick answer to a couple questions. What would be, in your mind, uh, the, the definition of a successful outcome of a commercial crew program? That's easy, uh, since you know we had to set the objectives, and if we meet those objectives, that would be successful. So we would like uh, more than one provider of low Earth orbit space, human space transportation capability. So we would definitely like more than one. If we just get one, and that's all that we can get, then so be it. But we would like to have more than one, and we would like that system to be able to not only deliver our astronauts to and from the in uh, International Space Station, but also to deliver other people for other purposes to other locations at low Earth orbit. Fair enough. Mark, how would you define success? I, I would add to that and, and agree with it, but I would also perhaps say that jobs in America as opposed to jobs outside of America, I think that the idea of multiple providers is, is what builds an industry, not just a single provider. But also I would say a vibrant partnership between government and, and the commercial industry. Uh, the, the main point we drive home is that we're not trying to displace. We're, all of us love the space industry, and we love the idea of going somewhere else, be it to the moon, Lagrange, or to Mars. And having the ability to lower costs to go to the low Earth orbit and to the station allows for more money to be spent on, on those exciting journeys. Jim? I will echo exactly what uh, everyone's already said and simply say we need to... This is perhaps one of the most important barriers that needs to be broken uh, and can be broken since John Glenn flew. This notion, I mean, uh, there's no question that Mike Melville changed the world in 2004 with the uh, X-1 flight. Uh, um, but, the fact, but the fact is, is that if we can show that a new paradigm of private industry working with the government to achieve a capability can not only work, not only be affordable, and not only deliver more results to the taxpayer, but also enable the government to go do what the government is uniquely capable of and, and hopefully challenged to go do, All of the, a lot of these arguments will stop happening, okay? And we just need to push through and get it done. And, and, and hopefully, once, we, once it happens, it'll change the game. Very good. Now, the question is, what are some of the risks to achieving those successful outcomes? Phil, what keeps you up at night? Oh, geez. There's so many. Uh, well, um, I don't believe, personally, that the biggest risks associated with getting a successful service are the biggest risks are technical. I believe that U.S. industry, uh, as evidenced by Mark's company, as well as the other companies that we got that will probably play in this program, will uh, are capable of doing this. Uh, I, so I do believe that it is sort of on the business side, which is why competition is so critical to our strategy, which is why the funding is also important. Um, we need to have multiple providers. We would like to have a portfolio of systems that can uh, launch these uh, launch our astronauts and other people to and from low Earth orbit. So I see the business side of the equation as the most difficult um, and the biggest challenge. And the way we mitigate that at NASA in our plans were to have and fund multiple providers through the development phase and then hopefully have two or more in the services phase, which is why I'm so concerned with some of the... Um, some of the new marks that we're getting out of some of the subcommittees, uh, it's really going to really going to challenge us to be able to have multiple providers with those kinds of monies. We don't want to have to be all in on one system. Uh, that doesn't build an industry, as Mark likes to say. I think that's a great line. It just builds a system. It sort of goes back to the way we were before. So that's that's what I see as the biggest challenge. Very good. Very good. Mark, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think from the, from the company perspective, it sounds a little bit arrogant, but I believe that our companies can build these systems, uh, orbital, 
uh, SpaceX, ourselves, and others are building and flying things. I, we don't think it's not that it's not hard or difficult. We don't think that's really the challenge. The biggest challenge on our side is uncertainty, and uncertainty specifically around regulation. Uh, we're in the process of building things right now. If we don't know what it is, what standards we're building towards, or what we're going to be asked to accomplish at the end of the day, it's going to be quite difficult for us to understand that. And so what we're trying to do is make sure whatever safety regulations, whatever flight regulations there are, that they're known as soon as possible so that we can properly design those controls and those systems into our, into our spacecraft and not find that out four or five years down the road after we've already built and started flying. Good. Jim, what are you worried about on commercial crew? Um, that the Republican Party will screw it up, um, <laughs> being my party. Um, we should take notes that he said. No, that. Um, <laughs> let's let's not let's. I think it's a risk yeah. that the White House will give up and not fight for their vision. Um, obviously, these aren't risks that we can necessarily do anything about, but they're risks we have to try to plan for and, 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 and deal with. Um, the, other, the other risk is just that, is that we don't do everything we can do. And I'm not talking about the companies now, and I'm not talking about the NASA officials who are running the program. I'm talking about the rest of us. We not do everything we can do to 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 make it clear that this is not I mean it is a revolution but it's not a revolution this is how we do everything else why should it be any different okay you no know, why should it be different for launching people to space it doesn't have to be different and if it is and if it is different when the entitlement com crunch comes in a couple of years there won't be any funding for any human spaceflight. And if we haven't invested and we haven't started to change the dynamic and change the paradigm, if it's still just about pork, you know, there won't be there there may not be enough corn left to plant as seed corn, let alone make popcorn and do all the other things that people seem to want to do with it. It does seem to be a, a narrow window we have here, an unusual one. Um are there any questions you'd like to ask each other? This no, is I was just going to say chance. that, Dennis. Uh, since this is all about being different, uh, commercial crew, we can make it different now. I actually have a, a question for Jim okay. in that um, once the space shuttle retires, most likely the next U.S. flagged vehicle that has humans on it are going to come out of the commercial crew program. And that's, that's, I said that all dramatically, but I do believe that's true. Uh, given, the way, given where we are at NASA, I believe the net, once space, the space shuttle retires sometime in next year, the next U.S. flag vehicle with humans on it will be out of the commercial crew program. Given that, what happened to all the concern associated with the gap? Uh, last year, the gap was everything. We've got to close the gap, got to close the gap. And now, uh, nobody seems to be concerned about that anymore. What happened to that concern? You're asking for intellectual consistency? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say the wrong town to expect that from. You, you remember, you're, I don't, you're I, out of Washington. I, I, I Listen, as the Mind the Gap manager for the Space Frontier Foundation that was out there with press releases on that very topic all last year and, and early this year, um, the fact is, is that ultimately there are always going to be some politicians who don't care about the result or the result they care about is jobs in their district, and that's all they care about, okay? And that's, that's it's, you know, Churchill said it, it's the worst possible system except for all the others, okay? So I, I wish, what I really do think is a cancer of space just being about pork, just being about white collar welfare, just being about jobs in aerospace states, uh, to say it more euphemistically, um, that cancer has metastasized. And I don't think there is, I mean, I can't believe, 10 years ago, 12, 11 years ago, when I worked on the staff of the Ohio Science Committee, we never, I mean, we occasionally would talk about political considerations, 
But we were always talking about what's the best approach for space? What's the best approach for U.S. leadership in space? And other things like that. And now that rhetoric may appear a little bit, but you don't see anything like the, 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 the intellectual honesty or the rigor or stuff that, that, that we, and I'm not saying this to toot my own horn because I wasn't necessarily effective at it, but, but you know, I, I don't see that many members of Congress who give a damn about whether we really get into space. They say they give a damn, but what they really care about is the solid rocket motor industry or the mission planning industry at JSC or something else. I don't see them really concerned about whether we get into space, and they would be perfectly happy if we just kicked this can down the street a few years and kept, kept people being, I mean, a senior staff member to a very senior appropriator, okay, told me explicitly, and I referred to this in my Space News op-ed this week, uh, uh, over a month ago, he said, the reason we need a heavy, to start a heavy lift program now is because we need a program to put all the Constellation workers on. Okay? Now, if that's your first order merit, you know, figure of merit for your system, for your strategy, you know, where do you employ the people? Where do you give them all jobs? Because we want to be compassionate and take care of them then it's not about space anymore at all. Yeah. Right. Mark, Mark do, you, do, you have a, do you have any questions yeah, for your fellow no, panelists? Jim, any, anything? Wait, there let me, okay. All right, then let's move on. And we, we need to wait for the microphone to arrive. Let's start uh, right here. Um, you mentioned that NASA might be buying seven or eight seats a year. Uh, over the last... 30 years, the shuttle has flown an average of 30 seats a year occupied by astronauts or guest astronauts, even at, averaging over the stand downs. Okay. Seven or eight seats a year in the future, I know that's not all, but it, it, the old Roman saying of mountains going to a labor, but a mouse is born, that concerns me. How is SpaceX or any of its competitors going to get their cost down if the flight rate is the equivalent of one and a quarter? Uh, dragons a year. I, I mean, you are depending on the other partners and commercial stuff doing something very large compared to what you're doing to make it work. Is the rest of your plan consistent with that? Well, it gets back to the business case, and I'm not sure, and it's not NASA's job to close the business case. This is what we've heard the administrators say several times. We have requirements for about eight astronauts a year to and from the International Space Station. That is consistent with our increment strategy for the ISS, so those are our requirements, um, and that's what we're going to hopefully contract for. Um, I personally believe that there is a big enough market to close the business case, but it goes back, I think Jim said it, we're going to have to wait and see. Uh, we're going to see how cost effective, how effective we all three and everyone else here that work on the commercial crew program in one way or another, either through advocacy or, or actually working on these systems, how successful we're going to be over the next five years. The, it is not a foregone conclusion uh, that we're going to be successful um, because of all the challenges. Uh, I don't think the last word has been spoken on NASA's requirements. I do think there is potentially an opportunity to change our increment strategy, but right now, uh, that's that's what it is, um, and I do believe that those are low numbers, and I'd like to get them up, um, and I'm working on that. But we'll we'll have to see how that process plays out. As it stands right now, that's what and NASA is all about requirements. Believe me, those are our requirements for eight astronaut um, flights per year, or not flights, round seats, trips. round trips. Yeah, round trips. Good point. Any other comments on that? <clears throat> Hey, Mark. Um, so, so many questions, but uh, only time for one. Uh, I noticed that in your charts that you were um, uh, partnering with Virgin Galactic for the, uh, the, space, the, the White Knight 2 for the drop testing and stuff. And I was just wondering, since uh, Dream Chaser was being, uh, is skipping suborbit and just going straight for orbital uh, development, um, can we expect no orbital vehicle out of Virgin Galactic? Or is Virgin Galactic going to stay with suborbit, and then um, Dream Chaser is going to be strictly orbit? Or is Virgin Galactic going to end up 
being a competitor for you because it seems like you guys are partnering right now? Yeah, I, I can't uh, speak for Virgin Galactic. That's not my job. I, I think what we're doing is we're focusing on an orbital vehicle. I believe that Richard Branson and his group, uh, they run airlines and they purchase the best airline, the, the best airplane that they can fly. Uh, and I think the ultimately what will happen is if there are orbital vehicles doing the job, then they see a, an orbital tourism market that they will then go out and procure the seats and instead of developing a vehicle on their own. It is a, a long and expensive process. They have focused in on the suborbital side. We're working on the motor development for them on that program, and our industry is one of partnerships. So at the end of the day, I believe, and, and I think my the other companies in this industry believe that those who prove uh, an orbital capacity that's reusable and affordable will get people from many different places to use it. And Virgin would then be a client like Airbus and Boeing sell vehicles to Virgin right now. Here comes the mic. Um, uh, two, two questions. It seems the subtext of both this and the last session is that the uh, Obama administration has been a fantastic friend, whatever their other policies, of human spaceflight. Do you agree? And the second is, which is perhaps more important, at different price points, what do you see the size of the market of taking people into space at, say, 50 million, which is the current price point, uh, 10 million and 1 million, at a steady state? In other words, after some initial uh, uh, bump. <clears throat> Who wants to take that? Well, I, I'd like to, uh, I'll take the first question, although I'm not part of the administration or part of the government. I, I think I'd rather characterize that instead of saying that they've been a, f a friend. I think that they have recognized that change is needed. And it is a very difficult thing to make change. Uh, the program as it was going was not affordable, not sustainable. And the, the, when, in our industry, when we look at stuff, we don't look at when do you start test flights. You, you ask the question, when are you getting into scheduled service? And when you ask that question, scheduled service was going to be many years, perhaps next decade. So I think what was recognized was that if there was going to be a program that very hard, tough decisions had been made, and I give them credit for having the courage to stand up to do that, to, make, to stand up and say, we have to find a way to make things different. On the second part of the question, it's interesting. One of the things that I talk about I didn't say in my speech today is that the reason, in my, my mind, one of the prime reasons we're all here today is because back in 1925, a decision was made, and it was called the Kelly Air Merrill Act. And back then, the government was facing the same decision they're facing now. Do we own the airlines? Do we own the infrastructure? Or do we support the building of an industry? Everywhere else in the world, the government made the decision, we're going to own the airline. British Airways, Alitalia, Air France, Air Canada, all government-owned airlines. The United States was different. It said, we're going to support the development of an industry. And they did that by saying, we're going to fly mail on airlines. And that way, we'll give you enough resources and revenue to get the business off the ground. And we're going to support and subsidize the building of airports and transportation and guidance systems. It's because of that that our industry in the United States grew to what it is. And I don't believe we would have had a vibrant space industry if we didn't have a vibrant airline industry be, uh, before that. And I think we're facing the same kind of thing today, that what we're looking to do is to be able to drive the, uh, the cost down. And if you go back and ask the question, how much did it cost to fly on an airline in 1925, and you equate it to today's costs, you'll find it's a pretty significant amount of cost. And we believe that there is a very large market. Uh, and it's more like we're sitting in Silicon Valley. No one knew what the internet was going to do until it got going. There are companies all over the internet right now that nobody imagined or dreamed of. We think that the space world is going to be the same thing. Once we have affordable and cheap transportation, cheaper transportation, we're going to have a lot of industries developing that weren't there right now. As far as market projections, uh, Chris Kraft, one of the great pioneers of the Apollo program, once told me that he couldn't prove there would be markets for the commercial sector in space, but he could prove that there will never be if we don't allow it and incentivize it. So that's a mantra that I think continues to be very useful as we talk about this. So I think uh, you know, proving that there are markets <clears throat> is not necessary. Let's at least enable them. So that's something to think about. Um, Rick, did you have a question? Yeah, I, um, the, the statement was made that you, your, your job is not to close the business case for the private sector orbitally. Conversely, I would say I would submit that the government's job is not to destroy the business case 
Um, and there is a, a strong argument that this, this crazy thing called Orion actually does destroy part of the business case. It's as if the government is giving you a spoonful of sugar and a spoonful of arsenic at the same time to create a self-fulfilling prophecy that there was inability. I, I know in the, in the case of Boeing, it's been said, it, it wipes out the business case for them. Um, the argument that it is some sort of uh, an orbital lifeboat, uh, I know from fairly good sources that the Dragon capsule can be convert, created, uh, converted to a, life, a lifeboat much more cheaply. They're already using geo-satellite wiring in there. They can extend their life up to 15 years for far less than the $4 billion. I'm sure Boeing is the same. I'm sure the other companies have that capability for far less. Why keep Orion alive if it's going to potentially wipe out the possibility for these guys to work with NASA? Now, I yes. will say that without NASA, they'll probably still continue. But, you know, the whole point is incentive here. Good question. Yes, Dennis, go ahead and tell us why Orion is being funded. <laughs> go ahead, Dennis. That's the beauty of being moderator. This is Dennis, I don't have is, to this answer is, the tough question. Dennis Stone. <laughs> Thanks. C3PO <laughs> office, Johnson Space Center, 281. I used to consider him my friend. <laughs> Until now. And, uh, Dennis Dot Stone. Why, are we, why are we continuing? Why are we continuing? Where's Deborah Orion? Warner from Space News? I think she's <laughs> back there. She is. Space News is here, ready to write it down. And okay, ready. moving right along now. And does anyone really want to take a stab at that one? Particularly on the non-NASA couch. For, 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 okay, L listen. Um, um, there is no question that NASA can and should be in the business of beyond Earth exploration. You need some sort of spacecraft for doing that. Okay? Um, Orion is a pretty expensive spacecraft for doing even that, let alone for doing low Earth orbit transportation. Um, I won't get into the issue of whether it's a good one for that or not, but at least it is, is in, originally designed for that purpose. Um, I'm not going to speak for any companies that are interested in orbital uh, space flight or commercial crew, but I suspect that if Lockheed Martin were fully engaged in developing such a spacecraft for exploration purposes, okay, uh, as long as there was full funding and appropriate standards set up for commercial crew to go forward, nobody would have a problem. But when Congress comes back and says, oh, by the way, uh, you know, you have to use, the, this has to be a backup or even, a, uh, you know, uh, or we want to ha have it available by this date or, or we want to have you use this launch vehicle for it uh, so that it can be, uh, and we're going to do all these things to hamper and hinder commercial crew, then you have a legitimate concern but I, I wouldn't want to talk about it as a concern of the companies. I would want to talk about it as a concern of the taxpayers, okay? Because it doesn't really, I mean, yes, it matters to whether or not we get the industry or not if the companies are unhappy, but ultimately it should be we are the ones who have standing as taxpayers to say why are we, you know, doing one thing with one hand and doing something else that's, you know, contravening. I mean, this is not space policy isometrics. You know, we really want to, you know, actually get there and do that and produce the result. Thanks for answering. I'll let you be my friend again. All right. Um, how about right in the back there? Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm not new to business, but I'm new to this industry. And uh, I wanted to ask a question hypothetically about a world where government funding wasn't involved, government funding is no longer supporting this industry. Uh, a year from now, what target audience would be left and what type of company would be serving them? Yeah, I can maybe address that because uh, this was one of my experiences with the Augustine Committee. Uh, we did see um, multiple companies come in and, and sort of pitch their perceived approach towards um, 
human space transportation to and from low Earth orbit. Consistently, everyone said that without any government support that there was really no viable way for them to get a return on their investment. Given the huge amounts of money that were associated with developing these systems and the very, very long lead, uh, lead time associated with getting that money back, that uh, it just was not credible for any of those. And this was consistent across multiple small companies, large companies, traditional companies, non-traditional companies. It's in the Augustine report uh, itself where it said that the pretty consistent message was that uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future, they didn't see that how that could, could be accomplished without some sort of government help. Um, so I, I would say that would be the answer that I would give to that question. Okay. I'll give you a chance now for your question. Did you still have one? Yeah. yeah. I okay. I thought you were just going to pass me by. I thought you were upset with me. <laughs> um, to Mark, the question, and then to Jim also. Quick context, there are some other sectors in the U.S. that are experiencing the same lack of consistency of policy formulation and are also experiencing, you know, election year results of this. So the energy sector has some partnerships that are experiencing it. You know, there are some folks here who know about next gen for DOT and it's not gone through reauthorization. So at that level, when you think about it at that level, have you got any observations or ideas, Mark, about some structure of public-private formulation that possibly could provide consistency to the commercial sector and could also deal with the political issues about the job formation. They might in one way automatically appear to be mutually exclusive, but have you thought about or has the Federation thought about a different structure that could bridge it? I think yes, we have thought about it and we're actually trying to implement it. And, and one of the big unknowns, I think, or things that hasn't really been out there is that when I went, I spent time in Florida and in Texas, it's not the government employees who are at job risk loss. It's the contractors. As I understand it, and maybe my, my, the NASA folks can, can expand on this, I don't believe that there are any job cuts being planned for the government employees in either Florida or, uh, or at Johnson. It's the contractor force. And so when we're looking at that, when you really come down to it, what are you doing? You're moving contractor employees from one company to another company. We've hired 500 people in the last year in my, in my company, which is the way it should be, is that the, the industry should self-regulate it. People go to the jobs where companies are doing the work, and whether or not it's company A, B, C, or D. Now, what we're doing that's a little bit different is that we're, we're reaching back into NASA saying, we think that there, we can have NASA centers on our team meaning that we were employing a certain amount of NASA people. Because why? Because there are brilliant people at NASA. What is the one thing that our industry doesn't have? And that is time. We're trying to accomplish, to move this as safely as possible within a, as, and as rapidly as possible. None of us want to recreate the wheel if we don't have to, which is why we're flying on an Atlas V. Uh, so if you think of that, our, our goal would be to try to figure out how we can use all those brilliant people who exist in the NASA system to help us out. And there are two ways that, that can be accomplished, and we'd like to see some government structuring around this. The first is encouraging that to happen so that there, the contracting process doesn't take a year for us to go out and sign a Space Act agreement where we're buying services from Ames or Langley. And the second is the government, the NASA facilities, to allow companies to have reasonable access at reasonable cost to those facilities to keep them alive, to keep them being used, it, right now is very unclear. Uh, there, there are facilities in Ohio where we might do some testing, and it's, they're unique. It's the only place that we can do them in the country. But it might take me two years to figure out how to get a contract to go up there and do that work. That's not going to work. So what we're trying to do is find a, a partnership, and I think one of my uh, panelists had said that. This is a truly a partnership in our view. It's not just a contract one way. It's a partnership. NASA will have involvement and, and uh, be there, in my, at least in our case, we hope they're, they're embedded in our company so that they can provide us as much data and information as possible and as much guidance as possible. But allowing for that kind of structure to happen, we think, could be key. And in the encouragement of that in the funding process can be very helpful.